pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Tychus, the dear brother, faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you may also know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Thanks, Mike. Well, good morning. Well, we've already heard uh, some pretty amazing things. Um, Bill's testimony and the things he shared about you for Christ. Uh, these are not small things. The Lord is doing a lot in our community. And the prayers of the saints give backbone and body to the feet of Jesus in this area. So let's keep on praying. Keep praying for Bill, who's uh, over there trying to hide. And Now, speaking of prayer... Let's ask the Lord to help us as we open up this book. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you that for all eternity you've had fellowship with your Son through your Spirit. Lord, that mystery of the Trinity. Uh, very few of us can understand it, but we will when we get to heaven. And Lord, thank you that even now, Lord, we have this privilege of being invited into that same relationship that you've had in the Trinity for all eternity. And here we are, we're a part of your family. Anyone that knows Christ Jesus is adopted into the family of God for our eternity. And Lord, thank you that whenever we open this book, Lord, you speak. And we pray, Father, that you would speak to us as your kids. We don't understand our parents all the time. And Lord, we need to understand what you want to share with us. So as we close out the book of Ephesians, Lord, we pray that you would speak in a manner which would impact us for all eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was 13 years old, just a couple of years ago, my uh, sisters and I were over at our grandparents. Now, we used to go there during the summertime. They lived in Suffolk, which is in England, where we grew up. And uh, we would spend pretty much the whole summer there. We'd had a pretty rough year. Um, my parents were not getting along. And uh, my sister had asked my grandmother the question, why do mom and dad argue? And uh, my grandmother had responded, well, they don't always argue. In fact, they used to be very, very happy with each other. And she proceeded to tell the three kids, myself and my two sisters, all about how they would go on these dates, how they would hold hands, how they would talk about everything, that they would laugh and giggle. My sisters and I were looking at each other. This is not the two adults that we know. And they said, it's going to be okay. What happens is going to be okay. So we went back home, and this was pretty much uh, uh, every year. Um, but this particular time, we went home, and there they were, arguing, mom and dad. This particular time, my mother yelled at my father, you don't love me anymore. And my father yelled back, yes, I do, woman. <laughs> I take out the trash, I repair the house, and I pay the bills. What more could you ask from me? And as he stormed out the house in his socks, which was his usual thing, he had a temper, and so to control his temper, he had raced out of the house and he'd walk the block. He flipped the plate that had chocolate eclairs on it on the kitchen table. The chocolate eclairs went and stuck to the ceiling. Now, it was painful at the time, but my sisters and I, we still remember it and we talk about it. Now, over the course of the next couple of years, my parents would continue to argue, continue to do the same things, and then eventually it ended in divorce. That is the story of many, many, many relationships in this world. The story of marriages, it's the story of friendships, it's the story of careers, bosses and employees, it's the story of siblings, it's the story in churches even. Even Christians get to this point where 
they no longer know how to communicate with other Christians. And sometimes, sometimes God's kids do not know how to communicate with their Father in heaven. There are times where, as Christians, we go through these phases in our life where we just do not have this intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ because we've forgotten what it was like when we first met him. We start getting under the pressures of this world, the pressures of just doing life. And Paul, as he's been writing to the church in Ephesus, he's been trying to encourage them to give them a strong foundation because of them being an early church, a new church. He's just founded this church. And he's telling them, first three chapters, we saw this. This is your identity in Christ. This is who you are. You are loved. It's not about what you do. It's about who you are. You are loved. The next two chapters, four through five, this is how you're going to walk in this world, how you're going to behave, how you're going to live as a result of who you are in Christ. However, you're going to come across a guy called Satan. There's going to be spiritual warfare. And so this church in Ephesus learned how to understand who they were in Christ and how to walk in the wealth that they had and then how to wage war. That is what the Lord began to teach them. Now, Paul closes out the book of Ephesians with a benediction. I'm going to read it to you. Chapter 6, verse 23. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice it says, love with faith. Peace to all Christians with love and faith. Love always comes with faith. It does not come with emotions. Now, there are emotions. But how often do we not feel like loving someone? And so, we don't. Bill gave that story. How hard it is to love someone who's in a lifestyle that is so different and opposite to what God tells us is healthy and good. And how do you love someone when they're in that dark place? It comes with faith. My mom and dad lost their love for each other. They just lost it. They loved when they were emotionally healthy to feel like loving each other. And when they weren't in a place where they felt like loving each other because of the pressures of life, they stopped. They quit. That's like every human being. And Paul is saying, peace, peace to you. It comes from God, your father. And love with faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. He goes on. When you have that kind of love with faith, when you love regardless of how you feel. He says, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Some translations say in sincerity, a sincere love. But undying love. Uh, Romans, uh, sorry, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 uh, verse 1 gives us the definition of love. It's the love that God has. It's a love that rejoices in all things. It hopes all things. It believes all things. It never fails an undying love it never quits god loves you he even loves me and he never 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 quits he'll never quit on you no matter what you do no matter how far you fall wherever you go he's going to keep pursuing you because he loves you and this is what paul has been trying to get across to the church in ephesus and this is what he's trying to get across to us just 60 years we're looking at around 95 AD, 60 years later, after Paul writes these words, this benediction, encouraging this church, this fledgling church to be strong. The love that the church of Ephesus had fizzled out. Now, we know this because we're going to be reading the autopsy report. This church died. It could have stayed strong, could have grown and blossomed, but instead it died. And the autopsy report that we're going to read in a little bit it's quite telling, and we're going to learn some things so that we can avoid the same pitfalls. Now, before we get there, we want to look at the strength and the foundation of this church. Now, the foundation of the Ephesians church is incredible. If you turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 19. So the book of Acts, chapter 19, we see the foundation of the church. Paul has gone to Ephesus. It's his first time. He knows that God is sending him there, and he's going to plant a church. 
And so what he does, because he was formerly a rabbi, he was Jewish before he became a Christian, he was used to going into synagogues and preaching. So that's what he does. So Acts 19 verse 9, uh, sorry, verse 8, it says he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months. Now that doesn't mean you just kept talking for three months like I do. He did stop, but every day he was going back and he was preaching there for three months. It says, verse 9, some hearts were hardened and some believed. But eventually he was chased out of the synagogue. It says he had to leave. So, but he didn't quit because, again, he had love with faith. He had a love for the lost. And he didn't quit when he didn't feel like preaching. He kept on because of the Holy Spirit living inside of him, having that compassion. And so he then goes, it says in verse 10, to the school of Tyrannus. Now, now this was an interesting school. It had been around for a while there in the city of Ephesus. And Tyrannus would allow people to rent out a lecture room in his school. And when they did this, they could then teach or lecture on philosophy or ideology or some new religion. It was open to anyone. And so Paul rented this for the space of two years, it says. And every day, he preached. He taught and he preached. His disciples who'd gotten saved in the synagogue when he was there for three months, they were bringing people in. You've got to hear this guy. And so they'd bring him in, and then Paul would speak, and poof, power of the gospel. This was the beginning of a church plant, the church of Ephesus, this little book that we've been reading about. Now, it's a good way to plant a church. Uh, this format has been used many, many times. Uh, I've used it. We uh, planted, my friends and I, we planted a church in Pennsylvania, uh, actually based on that, this passage. Uh, we got a little room, uh, a conference room in a little hotel called the Steamboat Inn near Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And we spent a year and a half. We invited people from the city. A lot of Amish came as well. Um, and eventually we were able to start a church. In England, we, were, we did the same thing. We rented a little conference room in a hotel and we got kicked out of that hotel. So then we went to a, an, an Alcoholics Anonymous building. They had their own building and we just preached. And eventually that became a church, and then we were able to buy a, a church building. Now there's a church right there. So it's a great way to do it. But what did not happen to us is what happens here next. Let's read uh, Acts chapter 19, verse 11. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Unusual miracles. How unusual? Well, it says this, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them. And the evil spirits went out of them. Now, that's unusual. We don't generally see that happening today. But this is the Apostle Paul as the beginning of the church is being founded. And this church needed a little bit of pep. It needed a little bit of power. And God was in the midst of them saying, Paul, you just be faithful. Keep preaching. And so he did. And then God started to do these things. Now, as a result of this, as you read on, you discover, if you jump forward to verse 23 and read through the rest of the chapter, you discover that the whole city, which was filled with all kinds of different religions, one of them predominantly being the occult, witchcraft. All the witches, all of those that were into occult practices, started burning their magic books, getting rid of all their bad stuff. In fact, people that had little silver idols to the gods, to Diana and all the different other gods that were there, they had been selling these idols, making a lot of money to all the poor people that didn't know any better. They thought that was how you were to worship the different gods and make it to get to a place called heaven. All of a sudden, they were coming across the power of the Lord Jesus Christ as they heard the gospel. And they started smashing their idols and they melted down the silver gods. And it says that the trade was stopped dead. There was no one left to actually buy these little idols because they were all turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was a riot. A whole city became in uproar. This was one man preaching this book. And lots of other people started joining in. And this is how the church of Ephesus got planted. This is how it started. It's quite an amazing foundation that this church had. So what happened that 60 years later, it's love for the Lord Jesus Christ would fizzle out? Well, let's have a look. Turn with me to the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation, right at the very end of the Bible. We're going to be in chapter 2. Before we get there, chapter 1, certainly in verse 9, the apostle John is in, he's having a vision from the Lord. It says he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. That would be today, Sunday. 
It's the Lord's day. And his heart is torn to turn towards the Lord, and he's hearing from God. He's in the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit is speaking to him, words from God, the Father. And John is supposed to write this down, which is where we get the book of Revelation. And as he's writing it down, we discover that Jesus himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, says to him, Write this down. I am the one, and as we read through, he's the one that's holding the seven stars in his hand, which we discover are pastors. Uh, they are also known as angels. The word angelos there, and in context, is not talking about angels. It's talking about messengers. So the pastors of these churches, he's holding them close because he wants to do an evaluation. And he starts to move between the seven candlesticks. And the scriptures tell us a little bit later on that these seven candlesticks are actually churches. A church should be a light in the darkness, should it not? And so the church of Ephesus is the first church that Jesus himself mentions in chapter 2. He tells John, you're going to write down what I tell you. I'm doing an evaluation of these churches. I am with my, and it says he has eyes like fire, hair like wool, white, Feet like bronze, like a judge. That's always representing judgment for the Old Testament. And judgment does begin at the house of the Lord. Heavy stuff. Jesus is looking at these churches and he's doing an evaluation. Now, have you ever been in a job where you've had an annual review? Get feeling a little bit uncomfortable when that time comes? <laughs> yeah, I have an annual review here. Um, I, I'm told what my, my, my strengths are, what my weaknesses are, and I need to hear this. Because otherwise, how would I know if I'm doing the right thing? And it's a healthy thing to have a review. And this is what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing. He's giving a review. And so that's chapter 1. Chapter 2 is the actual review he wrote down. And so John is writing it all down, just like Titicus wrote down Paul's letter that he delivered to the church in Ephesus. John starts to write it down. So here we go. Let's read the first evaluation. Now he's going to do seven evaluations, all seven churches that are in the area of modern-day Turkey. This is Asia Minor. The church of Ephesus is the first one. And that's the only one that we're going to look at. The other six churches are all church plants from the church of Ephesus. It's an amazing church. They spread throughout the entire region. Five of those churches are going to receive awesome annual reviews. You guys are great. You're doing it all right. Exactly what you should be. Two of those churches are going to receive warnings. You're strong in this area, but you're weak in this. Now, here we go. This is the strength of the Ephesians church. Chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel, that's again is the pastor, Angelos, not, not an actual angel, of the church of Ephesus, of Ephesus, write, These things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks amongst the seven cant golden lampstands. Again, pastors, churches. I know your works. I know your works. In other words, I know what you do. I know you inside out. I know where you've been, where you're going. No need to hide from me. Let's talk. This is our God. We talked about this last week, how prayer is an ongoing life of prayer. It's not so much about your prayer life, because you're always going to struggle with your prayer life, but it's an ongoing life of prayer. Just keep talking to your Savior. So I know your works. In fact, uh, chapter 3, I forget the verse, but he talks to the church of Pergamos. He says, I know where you live. <laughs> God knows where we live. So he says, I know your works, your labor, your patience. I know that you cannot bear with those who are evil. In other words, I know that you guys are hard workers. You're not lazy. You get up, you take the book, you open it, you spend time with God, and then you obey. And as the Holy Spirit leads you, off you go. And as a church, you've grown. You're hardworking. Look at what you're doing in the area, in the community. And you do not stand for evil. You don't stand for it. False teachers. Things that are happening in this society, you stand up and you speak truth. You don't just hide. You guys are good. Then he goes on to say this. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. Ooh, false teachers. People who are Christians, they get up and they start speaking stuff that's not in this book. We see that a lot today. This church was a good church. Then it goes on to say, again, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. This is a church that was strong in the word of God, strong in obeying God and doing all the right things. However, 
Then God says this, the Lord Jesus Christ, in this little letter, which I call a postcard, that's to be sent to the church of Revel uh, Ephesus. He says, nevertheless, verse 4, I have this against you. Oh, wait a minute. That was all the strengths of the church. Now we're coming to the weakness of the church. They had a fatal flaw. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, I have this against you. How would it be like to feel like you have, like the Lord has something against you? It does happen to all of us. And we're going to discover that this is actually the autopsy report of this church. Because the church of Ephesus does not listen to this evaluation. Every time you have an evaluation, every time I've had an evaluation, I'm supposed to look at that evaluation, as uncomfortable as it is, and go, yeah, you're right. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I do need to grow in this area. Okay, and then I have to put into plan an action where I'm actually going to do it. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And the church of Ephesus does not do that. They do not put into action. Now, we, on the other hand, can look at this and go, oh, yeah, maybe I'm afflicted with a similar problem. Hmm, I can put this into action. So this is what happens. Nevertheless, I have this against you, and you have left your first love. Oh. My parents, they left their first love. Now, God bless them. My father eventually became a Christian. He has a first love now. He's in heaven with the Lord. My mother, hopefully she will become a Christian. She's getting there. She's getting close. I love them to bits. But when they were married, there was a point in time where they had first love. They loved each other. They were important to each other beyond anything else. And then it started to slip. They left their first love. And for us as Christians, just like the church in Ephesus, it's easy as time goes on to forget to lose our first love. Things become more important than the Lord Jesus Christ. Our jobs, our family, good things, but they're more important than spending the time with the Lord Jesus Christ who can then help us with our family and our jobs. Even in the church, even in the church, serving can become more important than the Lord Jesus Christ. For me, I have to go into my study and I have to do this every single week and I have to go to the Lord. And there are times where I kind of go to the Lord and then I get into this rut of, okay, I've got my message down. I know where we are in the book of Ephesians. And I start bringing this message together. Halfway through the week, the Lord slaps me about the head. Did you talk to me? Did you spend time with me? Did you ask me? No. I left my first love. Something else became more important. Me. <laughs> Praise the Lord that he does evaluations, not just once a year, but daily. And the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you and me wants us so close to him that we are giddy as school kids every day with our Lord Jesus Christ in this wonderful love relationship. He does not want us to lose our first love. And so he goes on to say this. This is verse 5. He's about to do CPR on the church of Ephesus. He even gets the paddles out. Clear! He's going to bring the church of Ephesus back to life. This is how he does it, and this is how he does it for you and for me. Whenever we start to feel ourselves slipping, we get into this dry spot with the Lord. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. That's the first thing. Remember. Now, is remember what it was like when you first became a Christian. Maybe you know the exact day, maybe you don't. But you remember roughly when you first became aware that the Lord loved you so much that he died for you. And you start feeling his love being poured into your heart. Romans 5.2, the Holy Spirit, sorry, 5.5, five, five, the Holy Spirit pours the love of God into your heart. You cannot love the Lord without the Holy Spirit. So when Paul says back in Ephesians 5.18, be spirit filled, be filled with the Spirit, open up the Bible, Colossians 3.16, be filled with the Word of God. Take some of the Bible in every day and then allow God to fill you with his spirit. That's how you start to have the love of God with faith. You may not feel like praying, but God says pray. And so you start talking to the Lord, even though you don't feel like going to him. You may not feel like reading the word of God, but you do it anyway. And the, God, the Lord starts to fill you with his love. First love. And then the emotions follow. They kick in. You can become like a giddy little school kid with the Lord Jesus as you go to work. And it's boring and horrible. Or as you go into a situation that's tough. He's there. He's right there with you. But now you're talking and he's directing. This is first love. So remember what it was like when you first became a Christian. Then he says the second thing. Repent. Repent and do the first works. Now repent is a dirty word. It's not a word that many people are comfortable with. But the word itself is a, an amazing gift. 
It's the word metanoia in the Greek here, and it simply means to have a change of mind. You agree with God, and then you turn around and go back the direction that you're supposed to be going. Now, when I was driving downtown in Grand Rapids, uh, not that long ago, I had my GPS on. I know the area well. I used to live there, but things change, and so I had my GPS on. And I'm going down one of the main streets there. Uh, I'd just gotten off the beltway, and I could see ahead some traffic, and my GPS started to say, take a U-turn. What did, no, this is the quickest way. So I ignored the little lady in the little box on my dashboard. I said, mm -mm. And I kept going. Went past the next turn off, you know, to do the Michigan suicide left. And it said, take a U-turn. So I ignored it again. And it said, calculating, recalculating, take a U-turn. So I uh, turned my phone off. <laughs> I kept going. And then I saw the long line of traffic, realized there was a traffic accident. Turned my phone back on <laughs> and rebooted the uh, GPS. And the good news was that my phone is not like me. It didn't say, the little lady voice didn't come out, you idiot, I told you to take a U-turn and you didn't do it, therefore I'm done with you. <laughs> no, immediately it told me, take a U-turn. And I did. And then it said, keep going. And it directed me all the way to my destination. And that's what repentance is. God does not smack you about the head and say, that's it. I'm done with you. <laughs> he says, just repent. Remember what it was like before you did this thing, before you lost your first love, before you sinned, and turn. Just agree with me. One time you're doing this. If you guys are God, and I'm like talking to you like this, really, I'm not talking to you at all. I'm not praying to you. I'm praying to me. And then God gets a hold of me through his spirit. Repent. Sorry. Okay, now I have to talk to you guys. It wouldn't be fun if I preached to you like with my back turned to you. And sometimes that's what our life is like with our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, no, just face me. Let's do life together. Let me help you. That's prayer. We talked about that last week. And so remember Remember what it was like when you first became a Christian. Repent, turn around, get back into a prayer life. Just get back into talking to God. And if you're not sure how to talk to him, just ask him to help you. Just get back into it. And then finally, he says this. Repeat. He says, verse 16. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I just lost my passage. Where did it go? Oh, elevator music. Okay, I'm going to get there in a minute. I will. Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. Okay, there you go. <laughs> that would be the reason. Okay. It says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Do the first works. Repeat, in other words. Just go back to what you were doing when you first met Jesus. What did you do? Well, I remember for me, I got excited about reading the Bible. I didn't understand any of it. But boy, was I excited. I mean, I would read passages that had no sense to me. And I would ask God, what does this mean? I don't understand. If you find yourself opening up the Bible, but you don't talk to God and ask him to help you, go back to doing that. Repeat the first works. When I would walk into a situation and I didn't know quite what was happening, instead of reacting to what I was feeling, I would start asking God. I don't know what's going on here, Lord. What should I do? If you find yourself doing that and not asking God, go back to your first work. Start, start talking to him. Remember, repent, and repeat. It's that simple. If you're going through a dry spot in your walk with Jesus, just remember what it was like when you first met him. Song of Solomon 1.4 says that his love is greater than love for wine. In other words, his love is greater than your, your love for the world your love for your family, your love for a job or a career, even your own reputation. All that stuff is good, but your love for Jesus is far greater. Start to spend that time with him. He goes on to say this. Now, this is the church of Ephesus. This is an autopsy report because they did not remember, they did not repent, and they did not repeat those first works. They carried on doing just what they were doing before. They looked strong on the outside, but inside the love had died. It was not an undying love that Paul is ending the book of Ephesians with. This was a dying love. And so it says this. Verse 16. Repent. Repent. I'm sorry, not verse 16. I'm back in that other chapter again. 
God is really patient with me, and so are you. Thank you. Verse 5. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly, quickly, and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, we're going to get to an end of the book of Ephesians on that. The book of Ephesians talks about walking with Jesus, understanding who you are understanding how to walk in this world, and understanding how to wage warfare. Now, the Ephesians church had grasped that at the beginning of their life, but as they went on, they got too good at doing church. They started going through the motions. It was all an academic exercise. They could preach theology. They could teach it. They could do Bible studies. They could go out. They would pray for people. They would have things in the community going on. I mean, they were missionaries. They were church planting. But over time, it all became outward There was nothing inward. They lost their first love. And that is the fear that every Christian should have. We want to stay close to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you get to heaven, he's not going to ask you, what did you do? No. He already has a relationship with you. He's not going to ask you anything of that nature. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come here, you. Come into the joy of the Lord. That's the hope that every one of us has. And it could be... If you have not been spending time with the Lord closely, prayer maintenance, that's what we all need. I need it every week, and I don't do it every week. I need it, and so do you. It may be the Lord has been talking to you as I've been talking, and maybe you do have some dry seasons in your life. Maybe you're in one right now. Maybe there's some areas in your life where the Lord just wants you to be closer, to rekindle that flame of fire, to have a first love. What we're going to do now for just two minutes kind of like we did last week. We're not going to pray with each other, but what I want you to do is sit very still on your own and pray in silence. Ask the Lord to help you. If there's an area that you need him to just rekindle that flame, maybe it's the area of Bible study or prayer, or maybe it's evangelism or encouraging someone, whatever it is, ask the Lord to help you. Get back into that first love. Okay. I'm also going to be up here. I've got a few things that he's been poking at me at. So let's just pray for two minutes. Thank you, Lord, that we can come into the throne room of grace boldly in the time of need. Lord, the way into your very throne room is open. Lord, thank you that you do not tell any of us to stay away. Lord, thank you that as we remember and we repent and as we repeat those first works, Lord, you draw us into this relationship of love. And we pray, Lord, that you'd keep us close to your heart throughout the rest of this week. Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't have that surety of a relationship with you, then they're not maybe saved. They're not sure they're going to heaven. Lord, we pray that you would help them turn their hearts towards you. Lord, as they discover a first love. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask, actually, before you go, we have a video. I want to leave on an end, end, end on a high note here because there is a high note to end on. And this is, who is Jesus? If you are struggling in your walk with God at any point, always look to who Jesus is. And this may help you. It's going to help me. When I first saw this, it blessed me. It's actually a prayer prayed by J.B. Lockheed. Have a look at this. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? (laughs) My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of 
of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He threatens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. That is our king. And that is our king every day we get to walk with. I'm going to give you a benediction. It's the benediction that Paul just gave us that we looked at. As we close out the book of Ephesians, peace to the brethren, that's you guys and me, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all of you who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen. Have a wonderful, blessed day. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel by clicking the link on the upper left hand side of your screen so you can see all of our videos when they come out. Or you can watch last Sunday's sermon by clicking the video link on the bottom left of your screen. From all of us at Sylvester Community Church, thank you and God bless.